the most Mesozoic stratodinosaur fossils. Proceeding higher the supposed but falsely asserted geologic column, though not always or even usually higher in actual formational super, superposition, we've come to the ex extensive so-called Mesozoic strata, including the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous systems. The index fossils for these strata are again marine organisms, especially the ammonites. Again, there are many different kinds of these and of the other characteristic marine creatures of the period, and apparently they fall into large numbers or more or less distinct horizons, which have been used as a basis for interregional and even intercontinental correlation. It is probable that these zones of similar assemblages of fossils and rock strata can be ex explained on much the same basis as the zones of similar assemblages or, of trilobites and brachiopods in the Paleozoic strata, a worldwide flood. Very large or small, the only way it's going to bring these once living beings <laughs> to where they can be observed on the Earth's surface is a catastrophic lots of water, worldwide flood. The supposedly equivalent continental strata of the Mesozoic contain probably the most interesting of all fossils, those of the great dinosaurs. The question of the sudden extinction of these powerful creatures that supposedly ruled the Earth for so long is still one of the great ministry, uh, mysteries of uniformitarian pale paleontology. Of course, we have dinosaur footprints along the Paluxy River with human footprints in them, just a short while ago, evidently in history. Various theories have been suggested, such as destruction by volcanoes, changes in environments, eating of dinosaur eggs by increasing numbers of mammals, some sort of dinosaur disease, epidemic, and so on. Remember the, uh, <coughs> the uh, astro body of this interstellar body or outer space body that came and slammed down on the Cancun Peninsula or whatever and uh, caused so much water that all the dinosaurs drowned. But the other animals evidently didn't or something. It's weird. There are some of the theories that have been advanced to explain the sudden extinction of dinosaurs throughout the world. Each theory will explain the death of some dinosaurs in some places but attempts to apply any of them or combinations of them to worldwide extinction have failed. This dinosaur story is like a mystery thriller. Thriller, The last page is torn out. A most important part is missing. That is true, and the paleontologist knows it. He also knows the riddle that will probably never be solved. J.M. Good, White the Sucker with Dinosaur Quarry. Or at least it will never be, never will be solved as long as the paleontologist insists on uniformitarian explanations. Another mystery connected with the dinosaurs is the number of great dinosaur graveyards found in various parts of the world. The entombment of such numbers of such great creatures literally demands some form of catastrophic action. One such location, Dinosaur National Monument in Utah and Colorado in the Morrison Formation of the Jurassic, for example, has yielded remains of more than 300 dinosaurs of many different kinds. The quarry area is the dinosaur graveyard, not a place where they died. A majority of the remains probably floated down on westward and, and westward flowing river, down a westward flowing river, until they were stranded on a shallow sandbar. Some of them, such as the Stegosaurus, Stegosaurus, may have come from far away dry land areas to the west. Perhaps they drowned trying to ford a tributary tributary stream or were washed down away during floods. Some of the swamp dwellers may have mired down on the very sandbar that became their grave, while others may have floated for miles before they were, were being stranded. Jam good, white and stucker. They just have these stories. One could hardly ask for a better description of the way in which these great reptiles were overwhelmed, drowned and buried by the deluge waters. As far as changes within the dinosaur lines were concerned, the most conspicuous was the tendency for each group of fossils found in successfully higher located strata to evolve from small ancestors to large descendants. This result 
of smaller to the larger would follow from the hydrodynamic selectivity of water, as we discussed. On the other hand, evolutionist Dr. Colbert, probably the chief authority in dinosaurs, says it is interesting to note that giantism was achieved independently by various separate lines of dinosaurian evolution. Time and again in the collective history of these reptiles, a uh, phylogenetic line had its beginning with small animals and very quickly progressed to animals of large or even huge size. Colbert, Evolutionary Growth Rates of the Dinosaurs. However, the evidence points most strongly to a universal worldwide flood acting in accordance with the laws of hydrodynamic selectivity of moving water. It is not clear how much of this tendency has been inferred from actual fossil position in successive strata, but to the extent that it is based on objective field evidence, it would seem merely to result from the abilities of the larger and more mature animals to escape the floodwaters longer. This is exactly what one would expect to find in general in the dinosaurian sed sediments of the Danube. There's one big huge flood area, I forget where it is, Montana or someplace, where all the dinosaurs, many all mixed up, were all drowned or lay there, ex died, dead, and all pointing in the same direction as if they were flowing down a stream and then the stream was quickly drained away. Nobody bothered to select that and the stream was so huge that it had to be some catastrophic flood contributed by the worldwide flood, perhaps. Final flood deposit, mammal fossils. The so-called tertiary period is popularly known as the age of mammals because of the large numbers of mammalian fossils found in this strata. However, as with the so-called Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras, the divisions of the tertiary, tertiary and its stratigraphy are based primarily on marine deposits and marine organisms. The basic method of subdivision was established in a, in a rather remarkable manner. Sir Charles Lyell first divided the tertiary into Eocene, Miocene, and Pliocene on the basis of percentages of living species represented in each series, there being very few in the earliest <coughs> and a very large pop percentage in the later latest series. Later, the Oligocene was added by combining some of the uppermost Eocene with some of the lowermost Miocene. The still later term, Pleiocene, is used by some geologists to represent a separate epoch of the Cenozoic and by others to indicate the earliest part of the so-called Eocene, Eocene epoch. W.J. Miller, Introduction to Historical Geography, Geology, and Geography. Thus, the original divisions of the presumably most recent deposits were based squarely upon what amounts to the assumption of organic evolution. <clears throat> the chief index fossils <coughs> of the tertiary are the marine protozoa known as Formaminifera, Formaminifera, which occur in almost innumerable species and have been found in strata all the way from the earliest Paleozoic and still exist in abundance in the present oceans. Certain species of these small shelled animals are believed to have been rather universally distributed geographically in rather limited zones strategically, which lee lends them an apparent validity as index fossils. Actual correlations, however, are usually made only within the range of a particular oil field or some limited other such limited data. In their discussion of index fossils, evolutionists von England and Castor indicate the importance to the evolution model, which they have attributed to Formaminifera for identification purposes in these rocks. In the most recent Mesozoic, especially the Cenozoic rocks, great dependence by evolutionists is modernly placed on the Formaminiferal microscopic single cell forms in almost innumerable species, which, like the Graptolites, microscopic-sized shelled animals, were free-flowing, floating, free-floating, and evolutionists maintain experienced rapid evolutionary changes. Their minute cells, shells, and properly identified serve accordingly as index fossils to beds of only limited thickness. Von England and Castor. 
<clears throat> Recent studies, however, have cast great doubt upon the validity of formaminiferal dating, based as it is upon the different shell forms of the innumerable species of these small animals. It seems now that the most gross difference in shell form can be produced by members of any one species, and thus do not show either evolution or necessary differences in chronology at all, only the possibility of tremendous variation within each species. Dr. Langenheim of the Museum of Paleontology, University of California, he says, inasmuch as fossil foraminifera are of the preeminent economic importance, the work of Arnold with Allogramia lanicolorus has special interest to paleontologists. Arnold has made a complete study of the life history of, of this living forma foraminifer and has discovered, among other things, great morpho morphologic variation within laboratory cultures, inasmuch as these forms mimic most of the basic plans of formaminiferin test morphology, it may be deduced that specific and generic concepts based on shell shape, which includes all fossil foraminifera, are based on insecure biologic criteria, i.e. the evolutionists are wrong when they maintain that a different shell design constitutes another species rather than a variation within are of the same species. Any given body form of chamber arrangement apparently must be potentially derivative from almost any ancestral type. Italics are ours. This, of course, is of fundamental importance and indicates that a critical reevaluation of formaminiferin micropaleontology is in order. Langeman, Jr., Recent Developments in Paleontology. In other words, if we understand the implications of these studies correctly, any single species of formaminifer can yield tests essentially identical for those of any other species. Perhaps instead of the innumerable species of formaminifer, there is only one. Variation within species, perhaps, is the answer. Or, in truth, only a few species with tremendous variation in characteristics, such as shell types, as author Morris goes on to clarify. He says, of course, this is an overstatement, of there being only one species overstated in order to bring home the truth, but the general implication of evolutionary variation within the species seems valid. But what about the apparently well-worked-out and widely applicable techniques of micropaleontological te, micro dating based on forma, foraminifera, it seems now that the well-defined faunal zones do not actually represent evolutionary changes, but nevertheless, the zones are still there. The answer apparently is in the, that these zones, as we have been contending all along, are due strictly to the hydrodynamic sorting action of the floodwaters and sediments on which they were deposited. A spherical, dense rock is going to hit the bottom first. The original method of subdivision of the tertiary, that of percentages of living and extinct organisms, especially mollusks, are as well worked out by Lyell on the basis of the fossils found in the Paris Basin, is of course no longer considered definitive. But the basic terminology and division still persist. The Pleiocene, Pleiocene and Eocene and Oligocene strata are now identified mainly as associated with the large formaminifera known as nimalites and are, are no longer so predominant. It is significant that the tertiary deposits are usually found in more or less isolated patches rather than in great continuous sheets, as so often is true of the Paleozoic and Mesozoic beds. There are notable exceptions, however, sometimes occurring in great geosynclines. It is likely that the tertiary deposits represent, in most cases, the later stages of the deluge activities, as they are usually found either on or near the surface of and superimposed over Mesozoic beds. There are notable exceptions, 